It's probably the, the biggest fight in Britain this year. Yeah, I believe it is. It's huge for British boxing, this fight. And how do you beat Josh Kelly? Just turn up, but obviously make sure I'm 100% uh, ready, which I will be. And obviously I am for every fight. I believe the best of me beats the best of him. I'll be approaching the fight strong and hard from round one. I'll drag him into the trenches and take him into deep waters early on. He's a good fighter. I'm not listening to what other people are saying because I made that mistake in my last fight. So I'm preparing for the best Josh Kelly and hopefully I get the best Josh Kelly that turns up. You was on Team GB with Josh. Did you have a little thing with Fowler for a while as well? Was there a bit of to and fro with him back in the day? He beat me as an amateur and obviously when I was on GB, we were fighting for each other's places. He was number one, obviously I was number two. So there was never competition between you, Fowler? Just sparring, obviously that's why I got a bit heated up at times, but yeah, that, that's it really. Do you think any of that's going to get brought up in the press conferences coming up? What's been your toughest fight to date in the pros? Probably the Mason car fight, but I had a few problems outside the ring, so... What problems were they? Uh, ticket money, I, had, I lost a lot of ticket money. Uh, but 10 days before the fight, so I think somebody went in my house, took, took that. So someone stole your ticket money? Yeah. Obviously, I had to pay that out my own, out my own pocket back, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, like, just stuff like that. I went in, went in with a, a neck injury. I'm one of them fighters that, like, if I come down with an injury, I'd, I'd, but I, I wouldn't say no, I'd just keep it to myself. I'd fight through with it. You know? like, really, I should, like, I shouldn't have fought, really, but mm -hmm. I did, and obviously got the win. You hit the canvas, was it for the first time yeah. against Cartwright? Yeah. How was that coming back? Because you showed a lot of heart and you obviously come on so strong. What was it like in your pro career handling that? Strange, to be fair. Obviously, one minute I'm stood in front of him, and the next minute I'm looking at the floor and I was just, I, could, I, can, I can remember just being on the floor thinking, nah, what am I doing down here? Let's get up. Yeah, did you not see the punch coming? Was that? No, I didn't see it coming, that. How long did it take for you to recover? Because you looked, you looked pretty nah, switched on yeah, straight well, away. Yeah, we caught, like you said, it didn't buzz me or anything. It just, boom, just caught me, boom, mm. I was down. But recovered quick. And yeah. like I said, I just obviously I just got on my bike for the last the majority of the round. Next round, I was back to, back to usual. Yeah, it's like the majority of fighters, a lot of people give them stick, saying, yeah, yeah. oh, you've never overcome coming off the canvas and things. So you having that against Cartwright, who's a great fighter. Obviously, you've boxed some great I've been, guys. I've been, I've been down on scorecards and come back and won. Mm. Been knocked down, got up and won. Been in close fights. Been in the trenches with Cheeseman. So, yeah. Uh. When you trained for Cheeseman and you knew that he's a fighter of the year guy, he puts it on you no matter what, what was your training like? Was it more fitness based? Was was you knowing that you're gonna go in the trenches for the fight? Yeah, I knew obviously exactly what Cheeseman was was all about. Um, but I also knew exactly how the fight was gonna pan out. I had obviously I, I have said I did say that it'd be a close fight from round one all the way until whenever it end, whenever it lasts. But at some some point in the fight, it will catch fire, and if he stands and trades, then it'll be game over. Yeah, yeah, and a lovely shot as well on the mm. chin. It was well placed. I think he actually rolled into it, didn't he? Yeah, it was a shot that we were practicing on in the, in the changing room to the left hook. And yeah, that's what finished him. So you started boxing pretty young, right? You started 10, about 10 years old? Yeah, I started when I was 10. Uh, went to the boxing gym with my dad and I think we two brothers at the time. Obviously, back, back then it was... I was too young to compete, so I was just training hard, sparring. Just got, didn't like it, to be fair, just got bored of it. Uh, so I le left boxing, went and played football at the age of 11, up until 16. And then just walked back in the boxing gym. 16 year old, turned 17, two months after, and then had my first fight, four months of being in the gym. And how was that first fight going into it? Good, it was a good, a good fight. A boxer kid called Callum Lynn, uh, from Olympia, I think he was from. I think yeah, from Sunderland where he's a, he's an amateur coach now, so I still see him on the circuit. But yeah, it was a it was a war from for a few rounds. So you ever since your first fight, you yeah. uh, you know what you've been stuck yeah. in for. <laughs> and um, from that first fight, then how did you progress? So you've won some titles in your amateurs. Uh, was you at the same gym from your debut all the way through before going to Team GB? No, I've, I boxed with I boxed for Dalton ABC, 
Um, then I moved to a natural progression in Stockton and then went back to Dalton ABC. And then obviously went in the senior ABS and obviously eventually got onto Team GB. So you fought in the Nationals the year before you won it, right? It was against Fowler? Yeah, 2014. Yeah. When, when the senior elites uh, boxed seven times just to get to the final. Seven? Yeah, seven times. I did uh, quite a tough route. Seven fights, get to the final, box Fowler. Got beat on, uh, got beat on points. Uh, and then obviously the previous, the next following year, won it. Yeah, solid. And then you end up being on Team GB with most of the guys as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, I caught up pretty quick. Like, I started boxing at the age of 17. And mm. then, within, went, within a few years, I think I was 20. Three, twenty, twenty-three or something. I was on Team GB, so I caught up pretty quick. And well, we were saying off air how you live the life of a fighter. You always, even if you balloon up, it's just you put on muscle, really. Yeah, I rarely balloon up. Like you said, I do put a bit of weight on uh, when I'm out of when I'm out of camp. As like everybody, obviously, we deplete ourselves for nine or ten weeks. So when we get a chance to eat, we eat. Um, but I don't, I don't drink, and I obviously don't take drugs or anything like that. So. I just binge on food. There's worse things to be binging on, but uh, yeah, I just binge on like food, chocolate cakes, things like that. So I, I do put a bit of size on, but it's so muscle. I never really get a belly on me or anything like that. Do you ever struggle cutting weight though? Because you're very big at your weight. And obviously as you've grown into your frame, like, have you not struggled now sort of hitting? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, to be fair, obviously I have enough time. So if I need like, if I've got like nine, eight, nine weeks, and I don't struggle, like you say, I do it. I do it correct, and it comes off gradually over the weeks. Um, I had ten, eleven weeks this time, so this is the best time I've done the weight. This is the best I've done the weight this time, and I feel great at the minute. That's great. And in the amateurs, I, w- I want to try and cover quite a lot of that. When you first stepped foot at Team GB, was it? Did you trial some uh, some years? Did you get called up straight away? How did it work? I got beat off Fowler in uh, in two thousand fourteen. Then I got um. Got invited to go down for an assessment. So I was going down the assessments, sparring the, the guys down there, my weight. Who was that? Uh, Felix Cash, Danny Danny Woolwich, um, Danny Dignam, Amphi Fowler. So sparring them guys and then done four assessments and then got invited to, on, to be part of the team. I was on podium potential for four or five months and then moved me straight up to podium. That's quality. And how was the news? Did you just get a letter through the post? Did you get a phone call? Yeah, a letter. Just a letter through the post. That's sick. And how many fights did you have for Team GB? Um, I had quite a few, to be fair. Went to a few tournaments, a few WSBs. I can't remember how many I had, but I had a fair few. So good experience. I'm guessing you travelled the world with it. Yeah, that, that was it. Obviously, you travelled you travel the world and... Seeing some countries that I would never even have thought of seeing or never even heard of, so it was good. Have you got any good stories? Is there any good countries you went to where? Um, can't really do much, to be fair. Obviously, when you're away, you live the coaches and things, so just good food. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's always good food. And like you say, you're surrounded by athletes all over the world on, on the same path as yourself. So, it's, yeah, it's good. And who was your toughest fight as an amateur? Probably the Cuban, Alan Lopez. He was, um, when I boxed him, he was the Olympic champion and the world champion at the time. And before going into that fight with Ireland, what, what was your mindset going in? Did you just think, just put it on him from the start? Was, was there a bit it, of a game plan or? No, it was like a late replacement, to be fair. Obviously, I wasn't meant to be boxing him. Whoever was meant to be boxing him pulled out. So, one of the, obviously, the Rob McCracken just basically said, if if I took the fight, then there could be a possibility that I go to the qualifiers for the Olympics. So obviously it was no brainer. Obviously I was training, I was in the gym. Uh, obviously I took the fight, and it was at I think it was at your call WSB over five rounds. I got beat on points. Um, but give a good account of myself. He was like you say, he's world number one. So what did you learn from that fight? I learned a lot. To be fair, to be honest, he was. He was, a, I don't know if you've seen him, he's unbelievable talent. Punch really hard, switch it naturally. Um, he's very patient in there. I was just trying to like, 
I was trying to think while I was in there because if you watch the fight back, like if I, if I switched off at any moment, boom, he'd land like a big shot. So took a lot from that fight. Um, like you say, obviously that, just, that that set me up perfect for when I was turning pro. Mm -hmm. And was he the hardest puncher you fought? Would you say back then? Yeah, definitely. Even even now. Yeah. Even as a pro, he could, he could, he could really punch. I think he's he's turned professional. He's one of them Cubans who's just turned professional. I think he's turned over at light everywhere. Yeah, that's crazy with what's happened with Cuba, but it's yeah. going to be a whole new breed of pros now. It's going to be interesting. I'm glad none of them are my weight. I don't, <laughs> think, I don't think they are anyway. <laughs> no, at the moment. Yeah, that would be sick. So when you turned pro, what year was that? Uh, 2016. Was it quite a quick thing? Get your medical done, come straight to... Yeah, this, well, it was... Uh, Fowler got chose to go to the Olympics, so it was a case of stay on Team GB for another four years because it was a four-year cycle you had to sign into, or... Turn professional, I was thinking, where could I be in four years? Um, so obviously, I was just, uh, me, me, my goal was to always be a professional fighter. So, yeah, it was, I just turned pro. Did you feel like you always had more of a pro style as well? Yeah, a lot of people did say that I had a, uh, more of a pro style, even as an amateur. And I, I thought I did as well. So, yeah, I think I've, once I turned pro, I think I've adapted well. And, yeah, ch changed over pretty quick. You do very well in the later rounds, consistently. So if you give someone five rounds maximum, like yourself, you're not really going to get your maximum potential. Yeah. So you're, yeah, a bit like a diesel engine. Yeah, I'm a, like you said, so I'm a 12-round fighter. Uh, I get stronger as the, as the rounds go on. Um, but that's like, just obviously just living the life. I train really hard, sacrifice a lot, and it's all paying off so far. And what's been some of your hardest spars where you've where you've learned? Has there been some big camps where you've just progressed so much as a fighter in the pros? Yeah, I think I'm getting better and better each fight. If if I'm completely honest, I think I'm just. I think I'm just. I'm 31 now. I'm. I'm my prime years are ahead of me, and I'm yeah, really looking forward to the future. And who was your debut when you turned pro? Boxed a kid called Baroslav. God knows, from. I don't know where he was from. Boxed him in Edinburgh, 31st of October. Did you find it hard to sell tickets where it was in Edinburgh? Or? No, so like I've got a good uh, good following. I sold a lot of tickets for my debut. Um I boxed like a last minute replacement in like in Leicester within a with a week week to go. Took a couple of hundred people up there. Yeah, London, to my where 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 box. I've got a good following, so really, really appreciate it for all all the support of everybody. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just getting bigger and bigger. I've got the this fight coming up. I've got the whole of the northeast behind me. Mm -hmm. Well, even us popping here this morning, people popping in for tickets and that. You've yeah. hardly got any left, have you? No. Nah. So coming to this day, obviously your camp's going brilliantly. I see you running yesterday. Who's the guy? Is it Frank Warren fighter you've been training with? Yeah, Josh Franklin. Uh, Josh Franklin came up for. For the week, he's boxing a week before me, so came up for a bit of training. Um, obviously, fair play to him. He's come out of his comfort zone, mm -hmm. um, four and a half hours away from from where he, from where he stays, just to 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 do some rounds and some to train up here. Took him for some nice food, took him for a nice spa, and yeah, he's a he's a he's a great great talent. He's got a big future ahead of him as well. Yeah, good fighter. Very good fighter. And uh, you're a big coffee lover as well, aren't you? You're... Yeah, yeah, very Thank you for the, for the Costa. <laughs> they, had no, they had no cinnamon. What's that all about? Oh, yeah. Since you can't beat a bit of cinnamon in, 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 the, uh, in the winter cups. Mm -hmm. Especially getting uh, on a Sunday, all the coffee shops are closed as well. Around here? Yeah. yeah. yeah but it's our first time up north and you guys have been, been great. The gyms are great. People are friendly. It's, uh, although it's I support really Chelsea. Cold. Yeah, it's, it's really crazy. cold. And uh, well, we was in Newcastle yesterday and Chelsea lost, so that was pretty sad. Yeah, it was, let me down on my bet. <laughs> Are you a big football fan? Football? Uh, I used to be a big football fan. I, I like watching the football. And who do you support? <laughs> do you know what? I don't have... Everybody's giving me a stick over there. I don't, I don't support a team. Uh -huh. I just like watching football. Um, I, I wore Newcastle top for Josh Kelly's fight. That was just to stir, to stir the pot. Mm -hmm. People who knew what people who seen me in the Newcastle top knew exactly what I was doing. 
So what was you doing there? Because as a southerner as well, we understand like Sunderland, Newcastle. Sunderland, and Newcastle, was... I don't like each of us. So I wore some, a Newcastle top to to his fight to stir the pot. Got people talking. It made the fight, the fight's happening. I, him and his team didn't like it. For whatever reason, it upset them. It got under the skin. I thought, that's, what was plan- that's, what I, that's what I was meant to be doing. And it, it worked. Mm-hmm. He's not a big Sunderland fan. He, he goes on as if he's... Supports Sunderland. He's follows some. He doesn't follow Sunderland. I seen an interview. He said he's not. He's not a. He's not a football fan. He's not really a Sunderland supporter. But all of a sudden he's woke up and he's a diehard Sunderland fan. Where Sunderland tops to his fights, put Sunderland on his on his shorts. Everybody from Sunderland knows he's he's. He doesn't support him. He's just trying to. I don't know what he's trying to do. He might be just pretending to support them just to get the Sunderland back in. I don't know. Everybody knows why why I why I I had that Newcastle top on. It was just to stir the pot, mm-hmm. and like you say, it worked. And you've known Josh for quite a while now, right? On the circuit. Yeah, I've known him from the amateurs. Yeah. And how has your relationship been with him before this fight? Did you always know you're going to be meeting him at some point? No, I didn't. He, obviously, he was always a weight below. Even in the amateurs, weight below. Uh, as a professional, he was a uh, welterweight. So nah, obviously, until he obviously moved to a super welter, could have been a possible. There was a possibility, and then. Uh, Metcalf, I had JJ Metcalf as a mandatory for me British title. He withdrew from the purse bids, so Josh Kelly was Josh Kelly was next in line. And like you say, obviously here we are. And it's an even bigger fight, really. It's probably the the biggest fight in Britain this year. Yeah, I believe it is bigger, yeah, bigger than the Metcalf. Um, it's massive. It's huge for British boxing this fight. But with it, with two North East lads, it's going to be. It's happening in the north in the north in the North East. It's huge. And how do you beat Josh Kelly? Just turn up, but obviously make sure I'm 100% uh, ready, which I will be. And obviously I am for every fight. Uh, and yeah, I believe the best of me beats the best of him. Before we go any further in the podcast, I would just like to thank the proud sponsors of Not Just Boxing. Not Just Boxing is proudly sponsored by Titan Boxing. Titan Boxing is a UK fast-growing boxing business. They do personalised gloves, pads, T-shirts, everything. They've got UK free shipping. Go check them out with the link on screen. Gymfluencers.com are proud sponsors of Not Just Boxing. They are the premier health and fitness website. There you can find supplement discount codes, freebies, giveaways, a macro calculator. There's all sorts on there. So go check them out at gymfluencers.com or check out their at on Instagram at gymfluencers.official. There's a lot of critics that say Josh Kelly tires early and you start late. So a lot of people speculate in the fight, think that you're probably going to have a lot of success later on. Yeah, but I'm just gonna. I'll be approaching the fight strong and hard from round one. Knowing I can do twelve rounds at that sort of pace, so I'll drag him into the trenches and take him into deep waters early on. And as you said, where he has naturally been a one four seven his whole career, moving up and fighting you, and you already being big at one five four, it's it's pretty big. Yeah, it's um, like you say, he's he's a good fighter. I'm not listening to what other people are saying because. I made that mistake in my last fight. People were saying, oh, you're going to walk through him. You're going to beat him easy. Do... It doesn't always go like that. So obviously everyone's saying, oh, you're going to walk through Josh. You're going to... When you land, you're going to hurt him. He's not going to be able to do the, the distance. He might be training harder. He might have been killing himself to do one four seven. He might be able to do 12 rounds. So I'm preparing for the best Josh Kelly. And hopefully I get the best Josh Kelly that turns up. Well, you two, you're some of the biggest names now at this way in Britain, standard. And for this to happen... So like, out of nowhere, really, I didn't really think this fight would have would have happened at the start of the year. I think, uh, yeah, this is going to be fireworks. Christmas comes early, I've been saying. Yeah, that's what they're that's what saying. I'm looking forward to it. And moving back, so you was on Team GB with Josh, right? Yeah. And did you have a little thing with Fowler for a while as well? Was there a bit of to and fro with him back in the day? As amateurs? Mm-hmm. No, nah, not really. Obviously, I, he beat me as an amateur. And obviously, when I was on GB... We were fighting for each other's places. He was number one. Obviously, I was number two. I wanted to be number one. So that was it, really. There was no, nah, there was no beef. So there was never competition between you, Fowler, Kelly? Just sparring. Obviously, when just sparring. Obviously, yeah, just sparring. Obviously, that's why I got a bit heated up at times. But, yeah, that, that's it, really. Do you think any of that's going to get brought up in the press conferences coming up? Any of your sparring with Kelly or any, any things in the past? Um, if it does, then I can't see what he can say. I have sparred him a few times, good spars, 
Um, but what can you take from Spurs? You got big gloves on. You got mm. big head guards. Completely different to a fight. Completely different. Um, three rounds. So, yeah, good good sparring. We've had some, we've had, we had some good spars. What's been your biggest lows in boxing? Um, biggest lows in boxing as an amateur or professional. Both. Um, as an amateur, just well, not even just as an amateur as both. It's just trying to. Obviously, I've never really worked, so I've been like a, a professional athlete, even as an amateur, really. And it's just obviously trying to get by with having no money. So training with no money. Um, I lost my license one at one point for nine months. Obviously, I trained in Middlesbrough, which is 16 mile, or just under 16 mile away from where I live. Where do you live? Darlington. Ah, okay. So I lost my license for nine months. How'd you so do that? I, comp- I didn't. I had a traders policy at the time, and I, I was selling cars, just to make a bit of money. And I sold a car and left the insurance on one of my cars, and Peter Sonny was just going up and down the motorway, picking up speeding point speeding fines, and I end up, I end up totting up twenty eight points, I think. Wow. And they weren't even. It wasn't even me. How do you fight a case like that? I had to go to Lincoln. Uh, I had to go to Lincoln every week. I was getting up at like four in the morning to get there for like eight. It would take me four hours. Going to Lincoln, Norwich, so I had to go to. Um, well, just to go to like court to fight the court, case? Just go to court at eight in the morning. Otherwise, we're going to find me guilty mm. uh, in my absence. So I was getting up at daft o'clock in the morning, going down to Norwich to fight my case. So was you just saying, on this day, I was here, I've got photos of me here, I wasn't in the car? <sighs> Not even that, because like I didn't have no photos like to say where where like where I was. So I was just it just wasn't me. So basically I was just going and just saying it wasn't me. But it wasn't me. Um playing exceptional hardships and I was, obviously I was a, I'm a coach in the box in the boxing gym, I'm an amateur coach, so I saying I was an amateur coach, the kids need me to go to boxing shows. I've got nieces and nephews that need picking up things like I'm a professional athlete, I need to travel to train. But yeah, banned me for nine months. Um, which was good, really. Mm-hmm. It should have been a lot longer. But yeah, so I had no license for nine months when I had to train. I had fights coming up. How did you handle all of that then? I was relying on lifts, so that was it was a nightmare. I was relying on lifts to come and come back and forth to the gym, sparring, whatnot. So yeah, it was quite a lot of time at the time, but we over- overcome it like, mm-hmm. like like I always do. A lot of boxing fans. They always think that people are in boxing, there's loads of money in it. They don't, they don't really see the hardship that goes in. So, like you said, when when you've been living the life of an athlete for so long, a professional, there is no constant income. There is no real savings. It's I'm guessing you building your career, obviously knowing your future. It, it's it is tough. Can you explain a little bit about the financial hardship of you paying your coaches? You got to sell yeah. a certain amount of tickets. You've got. Probably a nutritionist on board, strength conditioning. You, you're coaching the amateur for you know for free for the love of the sport. Yeah, well, obviously my coach now is he's an amateur coach as well, so he does it for the love of the sport. He's got kids today in the championships. We've had championships from we've had champions every year from schoolboy to junior, youth, senior, and obviously I'm his first British champion. So obviously his fifth. I'm his first British champion. Oh, first. Like, okay, I was his I was fifth pro his and I'm his first British champion. So fair play to Craig. Obviously, hats off to him because it all goes to him. Obviously, everything that we, obviously everything that the boxers do in this gym, all the, all the credit should go to Craig because he does it all on his own. But yeah, it's hard. When I first turned pro, I was I was on a ticket. I was on a ticket deal. So the first fifty tickets go to your opponent the next 50 tickets I can go to the the promoter and then whatever you sell after that it's 50 50 so you know it's selling tickets for 40 pound in a small hall show nobody wants to go and watch as bad as it sounds even though they should be supporting you because that's when it when it counts when you sell tickets nobody wants to go and watch you so to sell over 100 tickets it's, it's hard mm-hmm. so if you sell 120 tickets, for instance, you're getting 
half of 20 tickets, so what's that? 400 quid. 400 quid, you box, you're doing a six, eight week camp. You're paying for your nutrition, you're paying for traveling up and down, sparring. Uh, you're paying for the equipment and then you're boxing for 400 quid. So would you say your support network you've had since obviously turning pro, you said you've had some good following. Have you had some sponsors from the start that have helped? Yeah, I've had, I've, I've had sponsors from the start that have helped that are still with me now. So they obviously they know they are. Massive. Who are they? Uh, Dash Media from Dalton. Um, and MNLK, Michael Kitson, Darren Pearson, Pearson from Teesside Way. So they've, they've been there from the start since I've set, I was selling tickets. So yeah. Obviously, without them, obviously things would be a, a lot, lot harder. But as the years have gone on, and the bigger I've gotten, the more following I've got. I've got other sponsors that have joined the team. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it obviously it does make a does having sponsors makes things a lot easier. And you said this fight, you've got loads. Yeah, this fight, I've I've had a, I've had good response on followers. Um, massive thanks to Lee Wilson, who does the fight sponsors. He looks after me sponsorships for me, um. So yeah, big shout out to him because he's he's saw some good sponsors for th for this fight. But yeah, obviously it all helps. I'm traveling up and down the country, sparring, staying in hotels. Uh, fuel 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 prices are ridiculous at the minute. Mm -hmm. My yeah. nutritionists. Um, have you had nutritionists from the start and strength conditioning? Have you, have you always had that? I've done I've done strength conditioning from the start. Not had nutritionists from the start. Just. I had nutritionist form just just since making soup well up, I think. Uh which was back in 2019. And you said of so you've been coaching. How long have you been coaching for? Been coach obviously I've been I've been helping out for the past couple of years, but I've done my coaching badges, I think it was last year, I think I don't know. So I'm guessing the amount of stuff you get back from coaching, it must be quite great, right? Yeah, obviously I just love I love uh, love giving back back to the to the kids and if there's anything that I can help with or show them, I, I, I love doing it. And I even learn off, off, off the kids. I watch some of the kids in the ESPY and like 10, 11, 12, 13 year old, and I watch them do things and like, got some great great kids in here. So I just start, yeah, I, I love watching them fight and I love traveling and watching watching them in the championships and, and whatnot, travel up and down the country watching them too. And do you think you being a teacher of boxing and a role model has helped you as a fighter? Yeah, definitely, because you don't want to um, don't want to disappoint nobody. So the kids that are looking up to you, you do like I, I don't just do it for myself. I do it for I do it for the kids in here. I do it for Craig. I do it for my family. I do it for the the whole northeast. I don't want to disappoint nobody. So that's why I train so hard. So when I still when I walk through them doors, the kids look at me and obviously still look at me as a champ. If you know what I mean. And of the kids in here as well. If you lose, they'll probably just torture you. So <laughs> is the banter good in here? Yeah, it's good banter, yeah. And where do you see yourself in three years' time? World champion. And who do you think you're going to beat for that when you start looking at the path? you got Is it Charlo at the top? Yeah, Charlo's at the top, but we've, I can't see him hanging around for a while. I think he'll... I think he's got Tim Zhu next and then maybe vacates or moves up, so... What's your thoughts on Tim Zhu? Because he's never fought out of Australia, I don't never, think. Never even watched him fight, to be honest. No? I was at one of his fights when I was in Sydney. What do you and think? Yeah, he's good, but he's not been tested. He's not been tested. If you look at your resume, yeah. some of the guys you fought, you know, it's you can see black and white who's actually had quite a good pro career of their record and yeah. who's been pretty padded. I'm not saying he's a bad fighter. I, I quite like him as a fighter, but he's not. He's not been tested. So let's see how he does in January. Yeah, no, I've never seen him fight. I'm looking forward to it, and obviously I'm also looking forward to see what happens after mm -hmm. if he moves up because. I'm ranked highly in three of the governing bodies, so who knows? Where are you ranked at the moment? So I'm number six in the WBO, eighth for the IBF, and twelfth in the WBA. So who knows if he moves up and all the belts get scattered, then could potentially be fighting for some sort of eliminator or or something in the in the new year. Does it feel good to know you're at the stage in your career where you are a few fights away from everything you've been training for ever since you started boxing? Yeah, definitely. It's just obviously got a Knuckle down, keep your feet on the ground. Uh, just keep progressing, keep winning. It's good. I like how much respect you've got for Josh, how you're not, you know, 
you know, overlooking things. Yeah, because there's been a lot of critics with his loss that he had, even though David Avanesian is one a world class fighter. Um, yeah, I like how much respect you've got for Josh going into this. You're not overlooking him at all. No, definitely not. Obviously, like I said, I'd, I'd be a fool if I was. Um, I've got a lot of respect for all my fighters, whether it was like my first fight as boxing a journeyman or if I was boxing a world champion. The respect still stays the same because you're getting in the ring at the end of the day, and it's it's a dangerous sport with them ten ounce gloves. Anything can happen, so you got to you got to be switched on. You got to respect what's in front of you. Yeah, and journeymen are such people don't understand. They're such a big part of boxing, and they're they're so tough going out every week. Um, boxing fans that don't really understand boxing, that the levels that you've learned in the pro game early on, that they they're valuable lessons that you're learning from someone, and it's, yeah, it's a I mean, tough life. Definitely, and let's be honest, the journeyman will beat ninety nine ninety nine percent of the boxing fans that just sit at home. Now they are these armchair armchair fans, so. It's easy just to sit there and give boxers a stick. You see boxers getting knocked out and then the next day you see memes all over the place. I think it's bang out of order, but it's the world we live in at the minute. Obviously, that's social media for you. Mm -hmm. And boxing's one of those sports, like I was saying in the car to Radu, if you were a runner, for example, and you lose, you come third, fourth, fifth, and you finally win a race, you, you know, win a gold medal at the Olympics, everyone praises you, no one cares yeah. that you lost. All the other times, getting to that. In boxing, you'll win the whole way through your career. One you get... loss is never gets forgotten about. Everyone loves you when you're winning. Once you lose, then you just get forgotten about. Yeah, the, the culture of boxing needs to change. And for that reason, it's why the best don't fight the best. Exactly. I think that's why everybody's afraid to lose. Like, a loss at the end of the day is... What is it? It's a loss mm -hmm. on your record. It doesn't kill you, just whatever... What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. I'm a big believer in that. So I've took every opportunity that I could or every opportunity that I've been handed to me. Well, not been handed to me, but every opportunity I've I've, I've been given, I've, I've took. Um, there's been fights that I've been offered. I've took them. For whatever reason, they haven't, they haven't escalated and they haven't been made. Big fights as well. Fights abroad. But it took them. Never, just never, never escalated. I think... As boxers, nobody like everybody wants an easy an easy touch. Nobody wants to fight the best. But it's a shame. What's your dream venue when you fight for a world title? Um, I'd love to fight in in Vegas. I'd love to love to fight somewhere in Vegas. Have you boxed much in America? Never, never boxed abroad apart from well, Scotland, Ireland. Never really boxed abroad. Brilliant. Well, it's been great having you on, Troy. I wish you all the best December the second. And uh, we'll catch up soon, mate. Yeah, definitely, mate. Thank you very much.